I thought it'd be useful for us to start today with a quick recap. Uh, we're recording this February 7th. And as you know, about three weeks ago, Fritz Gilbert from Retirement Manifesto posted a new article with Karsten Jeska called, Is the Bucket Strategy a Cheap Gimmick? And uh, no surprise with that title, their friendly debate, you know, kind of got a lot of traction on social media, the Bogleheads forum. And then, uh, you know, just about a week later, the two of them posted again, uh, this time on Karsten's blog, Early Retirement Now. And that article was called uh, Discussing Retirement Bucket Strategies. Now, you know, you and I were talking about these. They're both great articles. And then all of a sudden, we got a note from Karsten and Fritz that uh, asked us about coming back on the show again to talk with us. Yeah, man, they're they're uh, they're both friends of the show. We ha we've had them on the show separately, uh, but never together in the same room. And and this right. time now that now they're fighting. They have some they have some beef. So <laughs> just want to get right in the middle of that, right? Yes. <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a perfect topic, I think, for both you and I. And also, it's a question that our audience brings to us all the time. You know, moving from accumulation phase to drawdown phase, I'm thinking a lot about that. You are, you know, two years into this early retirement and you are practicing the drawdown and in some pretty tough market conditions. So yeah, I mean, this is, it's gonna be a great conversation. Now you and I have been talking about this for a while, but naturally anyone who's new to the conversation hasn't seen our earlier chats with Fritz and Karsten, they're definitely going to want to check out our the show notes where we'll have links to all those. And uh, for this episode, that's going to be at twosidesoffi.com slash bucket strategy. But maybe just a quick intro uh, before they join us. Both of our guests today are retired in June of 2018. Nice coincidence there. And <laughs> Fritz has been blogging at uh, theretirementmanifesto.com since 2015, I think. And he writes on all topics, honestly, but I think he's probably best known for this multi-part series on the bucket strategy that we're going to talk about today. Uh, now, Karsten has been blogging at earlyretirementnow.com since 2016, and I think it's safe to say he's best known for his series on safe withdrawal rates, and definitely he's also well known for doing some interesting but also very detailed financial modeling. Absolutely, yeah. Should we get these guys on? Definitely. Okay, let's bring them on. Karsten, Fritz, thank you guys for joining us. Welcome to the show. I, I want to get right into it here. Uh, as someone who is preparing to transition from the accumulation phase into the drawdown phase, uh, you know, some of the big questions on my mind are how can I actually start to develop this reliable paycheck in retirement? You know, what do I do with all of these accumulated assets? It, we're moving from the simple strategy of investing to something that's much more complex and figure out how to draw down without, you know, tanking the portfolio and sequence of return risk and all of these things, right? And I think I first read about your strategy, Fritz, on your blog, The Retirement Manifesto, the bucket strategy. But obviously, uh, there are other ways to do this. And as we're going to get into today, uh, both you, Fritz, and Karsten, you have you know talked about your various approaches on your blog. Um, and you guys have done an exchange on each of your respective blogs, talking about your different approaches. So Fritz, I thought I'd start with you. Can you describe sort of in de detail how you've developed this kind of reliable paycheck in retirement in these first few years of your retirement? Sure, Eric, and, and thanks. And, you know, kudos to you for recognizing the significance of moving from the accumulation to withdrawal. It's probably the biggest change that comes. I mean, obviously, the, 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 the non-physical stuff is huge, you know, the, the freedom of time and all that stuff you guys have talked about. But on a financial front, having a strategy in place well before you get to the starting line, as I call it, of retirement is critical because, you know, to do it right takes some time. And, yeah. and, uh, so let me talk about the bucket strategy. I was probably two years out from retirement. I was trying to think about exactly what you're thinking about now. How do I transition? What do I do differently? And somewhere I read, I'm not the one that invented the bucket strategy. It's been around, but it, it resonated with me. And, and the concept is basically three buckets. The first bucket is cash. In my case, I hold three years. I know um, we've talked a little bit, I think, with you guys in the past. And and uh, I think you guys are talking about maybe two years. And do you do the, the, the sinking fund for when you've got to replace a car? You can get into the minutia forever. But the basic concept is three years of cash, bucket one five to six years of bonds, maybe something, you know, REITs fit into this category where they, they might not have the returns of stock, but they also shouldn't have the volatility. So if the market's into an extended bear market, you can tap into bucket two and you've got some other assets you can use before you tap into bucket three. 
which is the remainder, you know, so if you have 30 years worth of stuff, let's say of, of investments, three years is cash, that's 10%, six years is bonds, that's 20%, 70% would be stocks. That, that's, a, that's one way to think about it. And the whole premise is to avoid sequence of return risk, which is selling your stocks during a bear market. So that's the premise. And the reason you have to think about it beforehand, as you're working, most people carry one to six months of emergency funds. That's totally fine when you're bringing in a paycheck. When you stop bringing in a paycheck, I wanted to build that buffer up to three years and it takes time to do that, right? So um, I've had readers ask me, when should I start? And, and just a, a nice rule of thumb to think about if you're three years out, you're starting to get into sequence of return. As you mentioned, Eric, you, you delayed your retirement because of the bear market, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you weren't going to retire yet. So if a bear market hits you a year or two before retirement, it can it's a risk. So starting to build that cash bucket up a few years before you get there is, is, a, is a big thing to think about. And I think it's important. So that's the, that's the, the general scope. From a tactical standpoint, what I then do is I set at least a year of that cash standalone, usually two years in a, in a money market 360, Capital One 360 money market account. And I just set up a transfer every month based on my safe withdrawal rate. And I say, okay, I can spend X. So I set that up, divide it by 12 and I transfer that much amount every month into my checking account. And that's it. I know I can, if it's in my checking account, I can spend it. I don't have to budget. At the end of the year, I can look at my beginning balance, my ending balance, and as long as I funnel everything through that 360 format, I can track my spending by just looking at the beginning and ending values. So that's the bucket strategy in a nutshell. You refill it, obviously, in an up market. We'll, I'm sure we'll get into this because this gets into some of the differences oh, yeah. between Karsten and I. But basically, in an up market, I refill it quarterly. And in a bear market, I, I'm patient and I give it time and I'm, I'm willing to draw it down for a couple of years if I need to. Great. Now, I, I think that's really helpful, Fritz. And I, I think would also help our audience out a lot, especially people new to this topic, is Karsten, to hear from you next, uh, because you are the one, uh, to be fair, that uh, has turned the bucket strategy window dressing, hence the uh, title of the first of these two blog posts. And maybe it would help if you could explain what you mean by this, Karsten, and then maybe what it is that you do in your own retirement uh, you know, practices, your withdrawal strategy. Right, right. So I, my claim to fame in the fire community is that I, I write about withdrawal strategies, right, and withdrawal right. rates, and I run all of these simulations. And um, in uh, the 56 parts that I've published so far, right, I've focused my energy on all sorts of different things, right, the, the, the rates, uh, what happens if you have supplemental cash flow, say, if right. you have social security later, uh, and out of 56 parts, I haven't really written much about, well, how do you do this, this practical short-term asset allocation, right? So you're sitting in front of your Fidelity portfolio one morning, right? And you have to pull money out. Well, where do you take it out? Do you take it out of stocks, out of bonds, out of cash? And the reason why I haven't really spent much time on that is that I think think that, you know, as long as you're within reasonable parameters, somewhere between, probably you don't want to go below a 60-40, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, or, or say say bonds would be, would be anything fixed income, right? kind of safe, diversifying asset, could be bonds, could be cash, could be a combination of the two, up to maybe 80-20. Uh, and um, right now, I'm probably somewhere smack in the middle in between something like 70, 30, 70% 70 uh, stocks and 30% uh, diversifying assets. If you're in that range, uh, I don't really care too much about how you do the month to month uh, withdrawals of that. If I, if I take it out of cash, when do I refill a cash bucket? I mean, I also have, obviously, I have a money market account with Fidelity, right? Money comes in there, sits there for a while. I can then pay my credit cards actually straight out of that Fidelity account because it, it actually has, an, it has the same routing number and everything like a checking account. So it mm. serves as an investment account and kind mm. of quasi checking account uh, to pay even uh, uh, credit card bills. So I, I do that, but I, I have to tell you, I'm not sweating it. And the reason why I'm not sweating it is that I, uh, I focus my energy to in, into the areas where it actually makes a difference, right? Where, so it's kind of the, the big schemes 
Should I be 100% equities? No, I shouldn't, right? And I did all the research uh, to, uh, to support that. Um, how much of a difference does it make when I uh, have supplemental cash flows that come in in the future, right? So, for example, at age 70, I will claim Social Security, and then my wife claims her benefits, and then she can take over my benefits. How much of a difference does that make? It's kind of actually, for, for some retirees, that makes a tremendous difference, right? I mean, you go from some basically baseline safe withdrawal rate of 3.5%, uh, for for a very long retirement, and then wow! But then you look at actual retirees, right? And you look at all the different cash flows that they have from pensions and from future social security. So sometimes you can raise that withdrawal rate from three and a half percent to five and a half percent, and um, uh, or or you look at you look at some other issues. Right now, the now the stock market is down. Is already well, it's it was down over twenty percent. I think now it's it's actually a little bit less than twenty percent from the peak. Um, what does that mean, right? Do I probably don't have to look at the at the historical fail safes because after the market is already down twenty percent, it's not like we're going to tag on another Great Depression or another dot com crash on top of that after being down already twenty percent. So some of these considerations, this is this is where the real meat is on the bone, whereas. You know, some of these smaller details, do I take now money out of my Fidelity account, the cash balance versus the bond balance versus the stock balance? That's that's probably not my main focus because it's 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 not really going to make a big difference in the in the big scheme. Um, and um, I mean, and, and Fritz, for example, uh, says that too, right? I mean, he's it's not like he's trying to tactically market time the 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 equity risk premium right uh, and uh, it's, not, it's not like he's going to generate so much alpha out of that that you can go from a three and a half percent safe withdrawal rate to a five and a half percent so th that would really take some serious market timing and probably mostly luck uh, and not market timing so uh, anyways I I focus my energies on where where uh, the, the the really important issues are. And then I'm, I kind of, I have to say, I kind of wing it in that sense. So I'm, uh, that, that's, one of the, that's one of the places where I'm not really uh, stressing out too much. As long as I'm within certain parameters anywhere, say if my, if my uh, target allocation is 70-30 and if I'm anywhere between 65 and 75 stocks, uh, that's, that's just all totally fine. And I'm not, I'm not trying to overthink that part. So okay. let, let me ask you a real pointed question, and I want to throw it to both of you to answer the same question. In a year like last year, 2022, how do you generate cash? How do you generate that retirement paycheck that I am, is it say I'm, this is my first year in retirement for the generic investor? Because that's kind of what I'm, I'm trying to just, I, and I know you have very special um, sort of option strategies and all those things, Karsten, but I want to, I want to put the two strategies side by side and be able to look at, okay, so what are the differences here? So, you know, if we're working with a, a portfolio, that's essentially 70, 30, and you are in 2022, right? Like Jason's portfolio right. here, and we have some equities and we've got some fixed income. How would you, how would you develop a, a paycheck based on that, based on last year? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, again, you get dividends and interest. So that, that's already coming out. I mean, it's probably the best from a, from a um, tax planning point of view. Um, you, you already set that aside and you consume that. And then the right. question is, if that's not enough, and it's likely not enough, right? Because interest right. rates weren't that high. That's right. Dividend yields in, say, the major indices, they were something like 1.7, uh, maybe maximum 2%. So that might not be enough to pay all the bills. And that, that means you have to liquidate some of the principal, which is not the end of the world, right? Because again, if, if say, a 4% rule of thumb works historically, the, the the interest rate and dividend yield wasn't always 4%, right? Is, is, if the 4% rule of thumb works on average, or the 3.5% uh, super safe rule of thumb works on average, it would always entail some level of uh, liquidating principle, which is totally okay, because on average, the, the, your equity returns should be high enough to sustain liquidating at least part of your principal. And um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, basically last year, the way it would have worked 
I mean, people point out that obviously say something like a 60-40 portfolio, a 75-25 portfolio had one of its worst records right. in history. It's just because it was the calendar year with the exactly the way it matched up. And then also bonds got really clobbered really badly, but actually the bond drawdown already started a little bit before the equity drawdown. So it actually turns out if you look at the uh, if you sat at your maximum, at your peak portfolio level in early 2022, and the market was drawing down, uh, chances were for most of the time, actually equities were down more than bonds. So right. you probably would have also taken money out of bonds and um, not really necessarily, you wouldn't have, you probably wouldn't have necessarily liquidated much of your equity portfolio, even in, in right. 2022, okay. They'd taken more money out of, out of bonds. I mean, as, as badly as the, as the diversification was uh, last year, but it, it wasn't so bad. So actually, because bonds were down a little bit less than stocks, at least at the, at the worst times uh, last year when the, when the market was at the absolute bottom. So in it, it it wasn't perfect diversification, but it was kind of kind of sort of like, like in the 1970s, for example, right? I mean, in the 1970s, you had uh, bad diversification, a positive correlation between stocks and bonds, but stocks were still down more than bonds. So there was a little bit of diversification benefit in that right. sense. Okay, so at the risk of getting this wrong, let me try to summarize because it sounds a lot like what I do. And I do have a 70-30 portfolio. Uh, I was able to, between the combination of dividends, not a dividend investor, they just happen, right? Uh, between dividends and sale of fixed income funds, so treasuries and bond funds, I was able to make up the difference. And then I rebalance back to my target allocation. So if I understand you right, that's pretty much what you're saying. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now let's contrast. So Fritz, you mm -hmm. mentioned in the bucket strategy, that you have these discrete amounts of uh, assets of different types, and then you're making decisions either on a quarterly basis or less frequently, depending on the market, how you sell them to generate the income to refill the cash bucket or spend down the cash bucket. Can you just give some specifics that will help kind of differentiate that approach from what we just talked about? Absolutely. And, and I think, um, you know, it's, it's important to note the quarterly refilling has, it paid dividends, bad pun, but it did. Um, I do a year end review. It's the only time of the year I look at my net worth. So I look at my net worth once a year on December 31st. And I have a, a kind of a checklist that's available on my blog where I, I go through a certain amount of things that I call my annual portfolio review. And as part of that, I refill bucket one. So I decide what's in. And if you remember, the bear market really didn't start until late January into February. So I actually refilled bucket one in uh, the first week of January. So I, I sold stocks because at the time my asset allocation for stocks was growing because the stocks were still on a tear. So I sold some stocks, filled up bucket one. So I went into January with a full bucket one, three years of protection, no problems. Bear market came. I wasn't worried in the least. I didn't even think about it. I'm sitting there going, okay, I got cash. Doesn't matter. You know, I, I'm content to go for two years and never have to sell anything. Just pull down bucket one, pull down bucket one. That's fine. Um, that said, as I go through the year, I do look every quarter at what I've spent. And if there's an opportunity to refill it, I'll, I'll, I'll refill it. And there were some, unfortunately, my dad passed away last year. Um, and, and there was some insurance. So I got, I got some insurance in April that refilled bucket one. Okay, terrible situation. It, 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 it wouldn't have mattered. And I wish he was still alive, obviously, because I was totally content draining bucket one for a few more years if I had to. But that's, that's just the way it happens. Sometimes you have unexpected income. That's, that's a reality. So, you know, when you have unexpected income, you look at it as an opportunity to refill bucket one, which is what I did in April. Okay, fine. Year goes on, market's still down, market's still down. Well, what I found in September, October, um, again, in the inheritance, there, my dad was big in individual stocks, which I, I'm a total portfolio. I'm a, I'm a diversification mutual fund. You know, that's, that's what I invest in. I don't do individual stocks. But the one advantage of some individual stocks is there was a stock that he had that was a defense contractor that was at an all-time high with things going on in Ukraine and whatnot. Defense stocks were doing well. My dad had a broker. I'm developing a relationship to him. You know, I'm a DIY guy, but I'm 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 right. 
just testing them out a little bit. Hey, maybe I'll use them if, you know, if I decide I don't want to do DIY or if I get hit by a bus, I can tell my wife to call this guy, whatever. So we talk occasionally and he said, hey, Fritz, you know, you might want to look at the stock. It's, it's up quite a bit. And I said, you know what? Not, not a bad point. Let's go ahead and sell it. And I, and I refilled bucket one because I had a counter cyclical stock that was available. So even in a bear market, keep your eyes open for opportunities. You know, it's unusual for everything to move in correlation. Last year, most everything did. But even in a year of high correlation, there can be opportunities, which is what I took advantage of, to, to refill bucket one. So had neither of those events happened, I would have been totally content to just continue my monthly paycheck, not worried about it, gotten to the end of the year, looked at it, said, okay, I still have two years left. And now you look at what's happened this year, things are starting to come back a little bit. Right. You know, I, 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 I probably will, can't tell the future, you know, but I, I probably would have written it out. And, and I did not sell any stocks other than the one stock that was um, very counter cyclical and was performing well. So that's, that's how I managed it. And I never lost any sleep. I wasn't nervous about the bear. You know, I just got on with my life and didn't really worry about the financial side of things. I mean, you, you guys have had a lot of comments on the two posts yeah. that you have made on your respective blogs. And there's a lot of back and forth has happened here. Um, and as someone who's thinking about how to develop this drawdown strategy myself, as I think about the bucket strategy, I like just inherently I can picture the buckets flowing into each other. And that's, there's some simplicity in that, that I just, that I have a natural affinity for that. Right. Um, but I start to wonder, and this is directed to you, Fritz, as I get through, I spend through bucket one of my cash. Okay. We're in a prolonged bear market and I'm dipping into bucket two and the bear market's still down. And at what point do we stop having to make these decisions about what to sell to refill the cash bucket? That, that seems like you reach a really dangerous point where you've drained bucket one, you're into bucket two and the bear market continues to crawl along and it may be, you know, who knows, five or 10 years before it actually recovers. And I know your buckets are tied to a yearly spend. Um, so your buckets, you know, the cash bucket holds three years and five to eight years in bucket two. Um, but for someone who hasn't set it up like that, isn't there some danger that you're going to be at the bottom point of this market, and then you're going to be forced to sell equities at the absolute worst time. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's the concern, right? And I and I think um, the reality of it is, if you get into a seven-year bear market, it doesn't matter what your strategy is. You're gonna you're gonna be facing sequence of return risk, right? So I, I think the only thing I would say is, hey, at least I had let's say six plus three nine years that I could ride it out before I was forced to sell equities. And I would certainly hope within those nine years, there would be an opportunity like I, like I had in, in late last year where you could find something that's counter cyclical to sure. fill it up. Um, that said, there's no doubt that, you know, an extended bear market, it, it, it brings up tremendous risk regardless of your strategy. Um, would I wait until I had bucket one and bucket two entirely empty? Probably not, because I'm also <laughs> looking at asset allocation every quarter. And if 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 I was tapping everything down, I'd be at 90% stocks and 10% everything else. Right. And I'd be like, oh, I'm 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 over I'm over allocated. I would have to do some rebalancing anyway, sure. which would generate the cash. So so there's an asset allocation component to this that is really important because you have to rebalance regardless of your strategy. If you read the Kitsis stuff, he's got some, some really good stuff on the importance of rebalancing regardless of your strategy. So that's, that's one thing. Rebalancing will always play into it. The second thing I would say is if you're in an extended bear market, you know, my spending and Jason, I think you said the same thing with yours. You, you have some discretionary stuff in there, right? Yeah. And I would inevitably, it's human nature, if you're in a really extended market, you would start cutting off some of the discretionary stuff and you would you would reduce your spending. So that three years in bucket one might actually last four, right? So I think you've got to look at the behavioral side of it as well and say, yeah, that's three years based on good times and a, and a you know fairly conservative. I, I've got a lot of padding in my budget, which I remember, Jason, you talked about. There's tremendous yeah. value in padding all your numbers. I've padded all my numbers. And I know I can reduce spending significantly without really changing our lifestyle. So I think sure. you have to factor that in as well. 
For sure. And I, I think that's really helpful exposition, uh, Fritz, and the idea of behavioral and psychological uh, factors is probably going to come up again because it's something on my list. But I'd like to ask Karsten to respond to that, because if I'm not mistaken, when I read you know, sort of your rebuttal in these two uh, blog posts, and but also some of your earlier writing, I think this is where the idea of window dressing comes from, because you are having to rebalance, to your point, right. Fritz. And so, Karsten, could you explain a little bit more about what you meant and and kind of just react to to how Fritz described that. Right. So uh, again, so so people might have gotten kind of the wrong uh, impression in the sense that I'm saying what Fritz is doing is bad. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that. So in fact, I say that what Fritz is doing and what I'm doing and what I'm doing in my simulation toolkit, right? So for example, in my simulation toolkit, I assume that uh, you set some asset allocation and that's rebalanced every month, oh, which sounds yeah. really unrealistic. And I'm not, I don't mm -hmm. want to sit with a sharp pencil every month, ma uh, yeah. month of the end, uh, end of the month and then rebalance. Oh, I have to now move $750 from here and $7,800 <laughs> from here. Nobody wants to do that. Uh, but I think it is a, still a great assumption for making these uh, simulations because it's the it's the most hands off assumption, right? Mm -hmm. Because anybody can claim, you know, I do some tactical allocation, and I move from this bucket to this bucket to this bucket to this bucket. Um, you're not going to beat, uh, say, hedge funds and uh, uh, high frequency trading hedge funds uh, that that are doing this on a, on a daily or even second to second basis. Uh, so as a retail investor, I think this is something where I just want to be hands off and, and I don't try to beat the market. And I also try to not fall behind the market either. Right. So I, I think about it when I was saving for retirement, right? I didn't do the opposite of this either. Right. I didn't put my money first into a money market account. And then I wait for an opportune time to right. invest it in the stock market, right? I always had this rush. I mean, even, even if I had done it, I, I would have always had this much of a rush uh, because uh, it really, no matter what the market does, I was always in a rush to invest in the market. So for example, if the market was going up, I was saying, oh my God, this market is on a tear up. I, I want to hop on the bandwagon. I want to participate in that. And the, the faster I invest the money, the better. Uh, so, so, sometimes people even write about, uh, you know, uh, padding your 401k contribution. You make your entire annual 401k contribution all in January just to right. just to get in really early. Uh, I, I never did that, but I, I automated my savings. Uh, and then when the market was down, I was also in a rush to invest because, said, hey, stocks are on sale now. I'm going to invest as quickly as I can. So I never try to play any games, no investing games, no market timing games, no mind games, uh, where I said, well, I, I will wait and put my money first in a money market account, and then I deploy it over time when I find the best time to invest in the stock market. And, and by the way, you know, I, I used mm -hmm. to work in, in asset allocation research for a, for a big uh, uh, asset manager. I was one of the uh, 10 largest asset managers in the world at BNY Mellon. So, uh, and, and uh, I had to do some of this stuff uh, uh, for a living and I, I would never even touch this kind of stuff uh, in, my, in my personal finances because I said, oh, as, a, as a retail investor without all the models and all of the uh, portfolio managers and traders uh, that take care of the, uh, this kind of uh, strategy, I, I, would, I would never beat the market. So I, I'm not trying to time anything. So, uh, and, and I, I follow that same rule in retirement. And uh, again, um, as long as I'm within certain bounds in my asset allocation that seem historically robust to uh, some of the worst case scenarios, uh, like the, another Great Depression or another uh, very inflationary shock during the 1970s and 80s, uh, if if uh, my portfolio would have survived that, then again, I can also claim I slept well during 2022 because I knew that, I mean, this is, this is not even half as bad as the 1970s in terms right. of the inflation shock. This is not even half as bad uh, as the uh, Great Depression uh, in terms of the equity drawdown. And um, 
so yeah, I mean, in, in that sense, I mean, is, for, I mean, both Fritz and I, we actually have already multiple market shocks under our belt, right? So yeah. 2018, we both retired in the summer. We had that drawdown in the fourth quarter in 2018. Uh, we had the pandemic uh, drawdown in uh, February, March. Uh, 2020, and now we have another uh, a drawdown that's that's a little bit longer lasting, uh, and also an inflationary drawdown. Whereas the the previous drawdowns they were all um, it was more deflationary, where bonds were good diversifiers. So it's it's kind of having all of the different bases covered. Uh, I I also sleep well, and and again I don't I don't need to have all of this extra. Uh, baggage around me with this with this bucket strategy. It's so what what I do uh, works just fine. And and again, I want to focus my energy on some of the other things. Um, so for example, uh, I, uh, uh, I, I, ju I just I just remember uh, in in a previous podcast you mentioned that now you're you're following my uh, my new cape construction, right? Yes. So I mean that that's that's something where where I say well you know if if historically the Cape uh, has uh, is, is, is if today Cape the, the Cape is at twenty three, but I read it off in the Schiller uh, sheet, and he estimates twenty nine. You know, is it between twenty nine and twenty three? That's a big enough difference that could actually make a make a difference in terms of equity valuations. Uh, so, so th this is this is where the real uh, th this is where I really want to spend my energy and not really looking too carefully into well do i take uh, something out of cash or bonds or or equities uh, so that's that's where i'm coming from Got it. so what is it about cash that seems to help us all sleep at night fritz cash is king right i mean i, I think you know to carson's point i, I think about you know in retire or as you're accumulating <laughs> of course you wouldn't put it in cash and then decide where to invest it right but i think in in retirement it's not an investment decision. It's not an accumulation decision. It's a withdrawal question. It's a drawdown. So I think in that case, if stocks are really on a tear and they're, you know, the CAPE ratio, maybe good, good indicator, maybe it's, it's, it's at all time highs. And you're thinking, you know, does it really hurt me to take a little bit of the froth off of the pudding right now, you know, the, the head off of the beer and set it aside in cash? Probably not, right? I'm not talking, you know, 20, 30 percent of your portfolio. I'm talking a maximum of 10. And I, and I, I, two things I'll say on that. Number one, cash definitely look at 2022. Cash was the highest performing asset class, right? There's times mm -hmm. when cash will do well. Even when it doesn't, as long as it's a managed allocation, it doesn't create that much of a drag on the portfolio either because it's only 10 percent. So, you know, my goal is not to create alpha, to create extra returns. It's to just not have to worry about this stuff. You know, life is too important to be worried about your financials and cash is one of the means that let, let, lets you get there. So um, that's one thing. The second thing is, I think, when you talk about a maximum allocation to cash, 10%, if you get an unexpected income that comes in and you're suddenly at 12%, well, it forces you to, some people, you've probably heard them. I, I hear it from my readers. I have too much cash. Like Carson said, you're, you're waiting for the bear market. You're waiting, when do I invest? When do I invest? <laughs> and, and, and you can get into this psychology where you're just stuck mm -hmm. holding cash. You know, if the market's going up, you're like, well, it's been going up for so long. I think I missed mm -hmm. the party. I don't want to invest now because, you know, and if the market's down, well, now the market's down. What if it keeps going down? And, and you get paralyzed. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the bucket strategy is once you get that 10%, if you get more money over that, guess what? It's time to invest it. So you look at bucket two and you say, okay, I'm only at four years. Maybe I'll buy some bonds, you know, or you look at your asset allocation. It's kind of the same thing, but it forces you to, to, to recognize there is danger in having too much cash. So cash is an interesting topic. Too much is a bad thing. Too little is a bad thing. You got to find the sweet spot that works for you. Yeah. And, yeah. and for sure. And I, I appreciate that answer for it. So I don't want to d d jump too deeply down the cash rabbit hole, but it's something I think about a lot because as we talked about way back when you were first on two sides of five, I do keep two years of cash. I do consider it also part of my fixed income allocation. So I'm 70, 30, and that means an absolute 5%, which just happens to be around two years of cash is my cash holding. I do 
treat it like any other part of my asset allocation though, which is perhaps different because I don't have a rule set around it. And so I've chosen to rebalance twice a year, uh, typically in November uh, and May. And what I do is I, yes, I am transferring money monthly from my cash allocation to pay my bills uh, as you both referenced. But then when I rebalance, I just consider another asset class that has to be managed. So I take it back to 5%, uh, you know, and, and move around, you know, like we said earlier, selling bonds to make sure that the, the balance stays as it should. So I don't know, honestly, at the end of the day, and Eric, and Eric has helped me on this a little bit, but I, I'm not going to say I have solutions yet. I do think about it mostly psychologically. Um, and I think Rob Berger talked about this recently as well when, when discussing the bucket strategy. I just think about it as I have this cash. It Yes, it meets my monthly expenses, but it also makes me feel better about not being forced perhaps to sell when I don't need to. But on the same note, uh, I definitely found myself, you know, last year, moving half of it into different tranches of, uh, you know, T-bills to like earn a little bit of a, a little bit of extra on it. So clearly I'm not doing anything risky, if you will, <clears throat> higher risk than cash. But I, I don't know. I do think about this psychological benefit. And I, I definitely, while I try to have, and I think I have a pretty good IPS driven logical approach to rebalancing, Clearly, there's a psychological element that makes me feel, you know, sleep better and feel better by having a couple of years of cash. I want to touch on this just for a minute. And I want to kind of push into it a little bit because I do think the, you know, the behavior, the, I did see some comments on both of your uh, blog posts about this, like, this is just, you know, preventing behavioral errors, selling yes. stocks at the at the worst possible time. Is there another, maybe better means of providing that kind of backstop of a fixed paycheck? I'm thinking annuities here. Um, Karsten, could you speak to that? Is there a better way to provide a fixed income paycheck here? Uh, okay, so uh, two, two things I just wanted to mention about the, the, the previous discussion. So first of all, when I say cash, I, I actually, that includes also money market funds and, and T-bills. And in fact, if so when I worked in finance and we were talking about cash, so cash means that's three months T-bills or, right. or some equivalent of that. Uh, the other thing is that um, when you set, for example, a, a strategic asset allocation, say in my uh, simulation toolkit, you can also choose cash, right? So yep. cash would then be the three month uh, uh, money market account uh, interest. Uh, and you have too much of it. Yes, I mean, you, you, the, by rebalancing that, right? If, if, if you have 12% cash and your target is 10, uh, you would then distribute these two extra percent after you make your withdrawal into the other buckets, buckets, so to say. And um, so, uh, so this was one of my points about my approach and Fritz's approach is not very different, right? Because what, what right. I am doing is a lot of the rebalancing has a lot of the same features as a bucket approach, right? You take, for example, money out of the buckets that have appreciated the most, right? Uh, and then even if there's still some left over and you strictly rebalance everything, yeah, then you would even take money out of bonds and put it into stocks if the uh, if the stock market drop is deep enough. So just just that, uh, and again, so this, the, so Fritz and I were on the, on the same page on many, yes. on many different things. But um, yeah, so annuities probably have become a little bit uh, more relevant again, right? Because we have higher interest rates. And um, I haven't recently checked what, uh, uh, what annuities are doing. If, uh, actually, my, my most recent post in the Safe Withdrawal Rate series is about annuities and yeah, pensions. Uh, but uh, again, that demand will definitely pick up because interest rates are higher again. So one thing I like about annuities is, right? I mean, it's... Uh, it exactly hedges your uh, longevity, right? So it goes back to this uh, this book that everybody's talking about now, Die With Zero, right? I mean, that right. would be one of the ways to exactly manage how much money you take out. And if you, it forces you to, to get that money and basically die with zero and probably give some gifts to your, to your heirs along the way. So it would solve that problem. Uh, the one problem it wouldn't solve is that what if we have another inflation spike like we had uh, recently, right? I mean, all the people that piled money into annuities right before this inflation spike. So uh, because the, the most popular 
annuity is obviously this SPIA, right? Single premium immediate annuity. And that is, it's actually pretty nice because there, there's so much competition and uh, it's almost like a commodity, right? I mean, you, and, and any kind of rate difference and any kind of difference between different providers uh, yeah, I mean, you, you just go with the one that has the highest payout now conditional on, of course, this has to be a, a, a reputable institution, but I mean, these are usually insurance companies. So, so don't go for the lowest rated one, go for a very highly rated, but then within the ones that have the same rating, go for the one with the highest payout, right? Because it's, right. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, just, just the same. It's, it's like uh, getting electricity, right? I mean, it doesn't matter which company provides the electrons that, that come here. I mean, it's all, it all pro, pro, produces the same light. It's almost like the same for... Uh, for annuities, yeah, absolutely. It it, it might uh, uh, look like an attractive. Maybe I, I wouldn't put my entire retirement into an annuity, but I think some people would say that uh, to provide something like a floor, yep. um, I put I take part of my portfolio, put that into an annuity. Uh, the the problem obviously is it uh, it has this inflation risk going forward because mm -hmm. these are only nominal. Uh, securities. So for example, the, the worst you could do is you, you put your entire retirement into an annuity, and then you get really high payments in the beginning, but then they basically phase out and die off because of inflation. So even if you wanted to put everything into an annuity, so keep some money uh, back and invest that in the stock market, and then buy additional annuities potentially uh, in the future to, to make up for that inflation loss, but uh, yeah, I mean, as annuities uh, are, are definitely something attractive. Of course, the best annuity, is, as people always say, the best annuity is social security, right? right. So, uh, make sure you max that out, do that spousal uh, joint claiming strategy where the higher paid uh, with the, the person with the higher benefits uh, waits until age 70. So there, there, there's some tools online that help you with that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you want to explore... <clears throat> additional options on on uh, annuities uh, it's probably becoming more interesting now yeah and let me weigh into eric i think yeah please uh, th thinking about it as you as you talked about it with the interest rates coming up I, i'm with karsten annuities were something i always eh, you know but with the interest rates coming up i've looked at it as a potential longevity hedge where you buy a deferred annuity that doesn't kick in until you're age 80 or something and then you've got, you know, that will last the rest of your life. So if you live to 110, guess what? Your annuity is still going to be there for you, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they are they are interesting. The thing I was go the thing I was thinking about, you can almost build your own annuity, and and, and never thought of it this way. But um, for my bucket too, it's bonds, and I've just started. I've got a post coming out this week um, about building a bond ladder, and the reason I'm building a bond ladder is it provides a future known <laughs> income stream, right? So you can buy target date ETFs, um, bullet shares. So you can buy a 2026 bullet share and it will mature in December of 2026. And you'll know exactly how much money you're gonna have. Right now it's paying about 4.7%, not bad. Theoretically, you could buy, I don't know how far out they go, but you could buy those out for as far as many years as they have them available. Sure. And you would in essence create an annuity with that portion of your portfolio to cover the next 10 years of spending, retain the rest of it in stocks to continue to have this inflation offset, you know, off, offset the exposure to inflation. <clears throat> and, and you could kind of do a partial annuity build through bond ladders. Yeah, I, I love that you brought this up, um, Fritz, because I wanted to ask you, that transition point, you went from, you know, the accumulation to the drawdown phase. What's changed in your bucket strategy? Is it just bucket two? Is that the only thing that's changed or have other things changed as you've gotten into this? Because what I'm trying to do is kind of obviously map my own plan out selfishly, but also prepare yeah. other people for, hey, let's set this up right. What did you correct? Yeah, I, I would say two things changed. Number one, um, obviously I retired in 2018, as did Karsten, and we had, a, we had three great years in a row, right? I kept bucket one constant at three years, but the stock market was on a tear. Yeah. So my portfolio grew, right? So bucket three got bigger because mm -hmm. stocks were doing so well. Even if I would sell them down to get my my three years, it, 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 it's kind of three years or 10%, whichever's higher, right? So or whichever's lower. So when I got to 
three years, but the portfolio has grown so much, I was actually down around eight or 9% cash, but I had okay. three years of cash. Yeah. So that was an interesting dynamic in a really hot market. It's it's almost a it's almost a glide path approach. Your equity exposure can actually grow, even though you're maintaining a fixed three years of spending. So that was an interesting dynamic. Um, that's one thing that changed. Obviously, it's come back into balance a little bit with the last bear market, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, the second thing I would say is is my bucket too, and I had a 401k, and within the 401k there are these guaranteed investment contracts. They're, they're typically called stable value funds. And they pay my cat just jumped up here. Sorry about that. <laughs> she said, <"Hi."> yeah. <laughs> I got, I got my writing studio uh, window door open and she came in. So I'll say hi to everybody. Is that there a main coon? Great. <laughs> yeah, like um, <laughs> so within bucket two, when I had my 401k, it was all in the stable value fund, which always paid, you know, one or 2% higher than you could buy on the open market. Uh -huh. And with the interest rates increasing, <clears throat> I've now been able to replace that. So what I did is I actually closed my 401k. I moved all the funds into individual IRA and Roth accounts with Vanguard brokerage accounts. And within those brokerage accounts to replace that stable value fund, I couldn't just leave it in a money market fund. It wasn't, it, it wasn't competitive with what I was getting. So I've redirected that money now and I've built a very intentional bond ladder as part of my bucket two strategy. So that's probably been the biggest structural change I've made to the portfolio. Great. Okay. You know, I'm not too surprised, you know, at, at this point in the conversation to, to gather that the two of you, Fritz and Carson are actually more on the same page than not. And I, I like to believe that anyone who's, you know, really thoroughly read what you put out there in the world, uh, which we're all thankful for, that that would be the case. Uh, but when I think about the comments, and I, I literally did read all the comments on both of these two blog Me posts, too. Um, which was great. It tells you so much about, uh, honestly, human psychology, and if nothing else. <laughs> um, one of the biggest take-homes for me was that People find just the simplicity, the logic that Eric referred to earlier in the bucket strategy is honestly very comforting and, and maybe in a framework that allows you to simplify something that otherwise could be complex in a world of a lot of complexity, right? There's all these decisions we make in drawing down. It's a huge <clears throat> change from accumulation. And I believe that that's one of the biggest, if not the largest appeal of it. On the other hand, when I look at the comments, when people say, well, I like I like Fritz's approach much better than Karsten's, a lot of the time it comes down to, I believe, that people conflate the sort of under the hood work that you've done, Karsten, to develop your strategy of safe withdrawal rate, the modeling that you do around it with what you're actually doing in strategic alloc asset allocation, which is you, as you say, I believe I'm not speaking for you incorrectly, actually very simple, if not simpler. Do I have that right? Or what would you yeah. add to that? Right. So, uh, so I, I sense that too, where people said that I prefer Fritz's approach because Karsten is going through all of this uh, numerical okay. mumbo jumbo, but well, what people didn't realize is that. So I went through all of this mumbo jumbo trying to replicate well why what is a, a bucket strategy actually doing yeah. why can it sometimes do better and why would it sometimes do worse and um i think uh, the, uh, the the real issue is not so much simplicity versus not simplicity i think the real issue is control versus uh versus sitting back and uh, taking a hands-off approach. So what I like to uh, compare this to, so imagine you're sitting on an airplane, right? And um, I, I sit on an airplane and I, I read something or listen to some music. There's some people who have uh, fears of flying. Right? Because yeah. they are out of control, right? Because they are not in control. So the pilots are in control. The, uh, the mechanics are in control. The air traffic controllers, as the name says, they're in control. And, um, and people find flying scarier than driving, even though on a mile for mile basis, it's actually safer to fly. And uh, of course, in the car, I have control. Uh, and I can control how safely or, or not so safely I drive, whereas on a plane, you, you're just, uh, you, you can't do anything. And I think uh, people have this urge to fidget with their portfolio and um and if they can't it gives people some discomfort and uh, so for me just like i i have the comfort that well you know 
I'm pretty sure these pilots, they're pretty well trained to the air traffic controllers. Well, I mean, obviously everybody makes mistakes, but uh, I cross my fingers that this is still a very safe uh, environment yeah. here. And I don't need to know, know anything more. And it's the same with my safe withdrawal rate analysis. Uh, I've studied safe withdrawal rates, um, say, using a strategic asset allocation with that crazy assumption of monthly rebalancing, which nobody really does. <clears throat> but that worked during uh, the, uh, the Great Depression. It worked during the 70s and 80s. Um, it worked during the 2000s. And that's really all I need to know. Now, maybe not everybody is comfortable with that. Uh, and um, maybe if you if you sit on a plane, maybe you bring a little plastic steering wheel with you and you pretend that you're flying the plane. And um, <laughs> I, I'm not saying if you do that, <clears throat> you're going to crash the plane, right? So the same thing, if you use a bucket strategy, you're not going to crash your retirement if you do that, right? It's, it's, it's just, it's, it, it doesn't have the potential to sway your portfolio uh, performance one way or another um but um, but having a little steering wheel on the plane is not going to save the plane either if it actually does crash so <clears throat> so so in, in in that sense i think people um um want to have this feeling of being in control of something when really for short term market fluctuations it's out of my control. It's out of everybody's control. You cannot market time yourself through a recession or a bear market. Um, it's uh, it's usually a hit or miss. And um, it's, it's, it's usually a combination of two approaches, right? One is, uh, so people always say, you know, show me your car and I tell you what kind of person you are. And I, I can also say, show me your strategy and I can tell you what kind of investor uh, you are. So for example, some elements of a bucket strategy sound like a momentum strategy, right? Trend yes. following, right? Yeah. If, if your portfolio is down, mm -hmm. uh, while my equity share is a little bit down, well, but you know what? I'm not going to rebalance yet because I'm afraid it falls more. So I'm going to write out this momentum and then wait until I rebalance. But at some point, at some point you have to rebalance. Exactly goes back to, goes back to your objection. Well, what happens if you eventually have to rebalance? Now you do the opposite of momentum, right? Now you do something called valuation, right? You have to sell something that is up and buy something that is down, or you have to sell bonds, but maybe bonds are, might be down too, but you but they're down less. So now you do this valuation rebalance. So valuation in the sense, it's not value stocks versus growth stocks. That's that's another discussion. Uh, don't, don't talk about that. Um, what what I'm meaning here is that so you have to sell something that is up more and you have to buy something that is down so you to to bring things back so this is like the the rebalancing that you have deferred for the longest time so instead of doing a strategic asset allocation so and then this jumping back between momentum and valuation that is one of the hardest things to get right in finance and in this short term market timing right because sometimes you want to keep riding the wave. Uh, and sometimes, uh, obviously, what you want to do is right at the turning point, that's when you want to do the valuation again, right? That's so you basically sell your Bitcoin at $65,000, right, and move it into something else. But nobody gets this right, obviously, in real time, because nobody really knows where is the right point to rebalance? When is it time to abandon this momentum approach and go back to valuation? And this is something really, really hard. And and I, I'm I'm just saying that again with the bucket approach, it's not like you're going to crash the plane and you're not going to save the plane. Uh, I mean, you just uh, I personally lean back and enjoy the ride and watch the movie on the plane. But uh, if uh, if uh, if if it uh, makes people uh, feel better on the plane, maybe pretend you are in control of the plane, even if. And, you know, and the funny thing is, you probably have to store that uh, plastic wheel for takeoff and landing, uh, which is the which is the scariest time of the plane ride, uh, ironically. But anyways, so so I, I think it's 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 part of it is simplicity and a misunderstanding, obviously, what I mean by okay. simplicity. So so 
it's, I, one of the analogies, again, airplane analogy is you don't have to understand all the mechanics of the airplane or the car. Um, other people have worried about that. So think about that as me. So I've worried about, well, you know what, does a strategic asset allocation is probably gives you roughly the same results as the bucket strategy or, or what I am doing in practice with occasionally you rebalance here or there. Um, but uh, it's it's uh, not going to beat the market. It's not going to underperform the market. On average, it's going to be all the same. And uh, so let the let let me do all the hard work so that you can lean back and uh, enjoy the ride. So God, God, my, no. my palms are sweating here, Karsten, because <laughs> I, I am one of those people who hates flying. But that's right. I was thinking it the whole time. <laughs> yeah. But I have to say, I am fearful of me being in control of that almost as much. I would rather create this simple rule set, which I feel like, you know, I was initially drawn to the bucket strategy. Your post on, on this Fritz was amazing, right? It's, it has every bit of appeal for me because there is a simple sort of flow through there. But as I get into the details, and sometimes when I hear you explain this, like every quarter I'm doing this and I'm making that, I almost don't trust myself enough to not be the market timer, the momentum rider that You're I know such a market timer. that's that's who I am. And so I feel like setting a, a, this rule set, and I feel like Jason maybe is closest to this, where he says once a year, I'm taking, you know, my I'm going to fill a cash bucket. And maybe this is a hybrid approach, you know, I'm going to fill the cash bucket and then I'm going to rebalance to my asset allocation, the target asset allocation. And I, I don't know, I mean, Fritz, you must have um. I mean, I know you enjoy doing this, but how do you speak to someone who is in my position like this? Should I just do that once a year, rebalance, you know, take my cash and rebalance to my target asset allocation? Yeah, which, which really, if you think about it, strategic asset allocation and that approach are basically the same thing. And I would argue the bucket strategy is the same thing. That's basically what I do. I, I refill bucket one. I look at my asset allocation and I rebalance if necessary. So we're saying the same thing. Yeah. And, and, it, it sounds like I do a lot, but you know, I, I think I did the math in one of my posts. How much time do I spend on my finances? And it was like 0.24% of my time, right? It's, it's nothing. It's literally hours a year, hours, like single digit hours per year. It doesn't take much time. Yeah. What I like about it, back to your, um, the value of the simplicity first, and then I'll get into the, how you manage it. The value of the simplicity, none of us, well, maybe some, but most of us aren't going through retirement alone, right? We have a spouse, we have a significant other, we have children, we have parents, whatever. Um, and in a lot of cases, your significant other may not really want to get into the details of this stuff, right? Um, having the ability to simply and, and clearly lay out, hey, we've got three years of cash, we never have to worry about it. We've got six years after that, that we can still get through. Don't worry about the headline about the stock market. It, it's not, you know, we've got a lot of time before we have to worry about it. That brings peace of mind, not only to me managing it, but to my wife who doesn't really want to get into the details of it. So the, there is value in being able to communicate what you're doing in a manner that people can understand. I, I, I don't think you can underestimate the value of that, understanding it. Then when you actually get into the tactics of it, it, it is kind of what Jason's doing. It's, it's you know, I, I really focus on my year end is when I when I really focus on looking at all the numbers. I, I absolutely rebalance at the end of the year. I may not during the quarters. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, yeah, you're, you're, you're protecting cash first and then you're rebalancing. That's the bucket strategy. But it's got the element of protecting cash versus strategic allocation just says go straight with the numbers. That's it. Whatever the numbers say you rebalance to. The only difference with the bucket strategy is you you get the cash taken care of first, and then you look at what's left. So yeah. that's that's really the only minor difference. Okay. Yeah, so I remember right, you described it as strategic alloc asset allocation with a focus on the cash allocation. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It just it just requires some extra thought though. Like you know, what am I going to sell? What if there are no winners to sell? I'm looking at my portfolio or what if, you know, that's the, that's the piece that I can't get around, which is why I just say, well, if my target asset allocation is 70, 30, I'm just going to sell whatever and rebalance. Yeah. Right? And, and that, that doesn't that, matter. That, that, that is where there is a more behavioral and emotional element to it than, than there is in the, in the straight strategic asset allocation, yeah. because you do have to make that decision 
am I comfortable with the cash continuing to draw down? Because, hey, from an asset allocation standpoint, you know, whatever. It, it, you don't just automatically rebalance like you do in strategic asset allocation. The, the trick has got to be to remove the emotions from it and say, hey, the numbers are saying this. I know I need to rebalance. And you've just got to have that discipline to go through the process, again, with the focus on protecting the cash. And, and it, it does open up a little bit of the behavioral side of it, which I think is Carson's main argument to it is, hey, I just rebalance. That's it. Nothing else to right. it. Right. Mine is I rebalance, but I put the focus on cash. Yep. That's great. Jason? Well, I mean, we may not have solved world peace here, but I feel like... <laughs> I hope that a viewer of this will sort of get the take home about just how many similarities there are between your approaches. I think there was actually a nice little coda there at the end about where some decision-making comes in in your approach, Fritz. And, and, and that may be very appealing to some people and maybe not. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, there's an awful lot of similarity between what each of you are describing in terms of setting and maintaining an asset alloc alloc allocation by a rebalancing. I, I did want to kind of, I, I want to be respectful of your time, but I would, it would be nice to wrap up here with um, what you guys are doing in life right now, because we save and accumulate all of these assets to live life. And, you know, as someone who's looking forward to that post uh, FI life uh, and living vicariously through all of you, I'd like to hear what you're up to right now, Karsten. What are you, are you traveling? Are you, what's, what's life yeah. look like? Yeah, actually, um, I'm uh, teaching a class right now. So today is actually, uh, so I teach every Tuesday, 6 to 9 p.m. at the UC Berkeley Extension Program. So I'm teaching macroeconomics. Uh, and uh, so I just, it's not for the money. It's just to, to stay relevant and, uh, and sharp. So um, I just uh, basically blocked my spring to, uh, to uh, got some work. Got a, got, a, got a side gig. You came out uh, of retirement. That, <laughs> yes. So, uh, and uh, yeah, we have a lot of travel lined up. Uh, so we have a cruise coming up during my daughter's spring break. So we're going to fly to San Diego and take a cruise ship to Mexico for a week. Awesome. And uh, summer travel, we already have a month and a half uh, travel plan to Europe. So nice. landing in uh, Milan and then making our way north to uh visiting family in Germany, then heading to Scandinavia and doing a cruise through the Baltic Sea. And um, then coming back before school starts. And then uh, later in November, we booked a cruise uh, from Istanbul uh, to Dubai. Wow. So visit the uh, visit Turkey, Holy Land, Egypt, uh, through the Suez Canal, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and then uh, uh, Emirates. So that that's a 19 day cruise. And wow. uh, yeah, so it's a lot of things that we couldn't have done if I had still worked in a corporate job. Uh, sure. Because uh, I mean, I'm still I'm still busy, you know, I, uh, because we have a daughter in school, we get up every morning at 630 and get oh, our yeah. daughter ready for school. <laughs> and uh, it, it doesn't really feel like the typical retirement. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we're staying busy and um, volunteering a lot at school at church. Uh, so it's a uh, so it's a very fulfilled and uh, a busy life, but busy in a good sense. Amazing. Fritz, how about you? Yeah, you know, I, I was thinking about it as you asked the question. Um, there's something more important than money when you get into retirement, and Jason may, may appreciate this. Once you get into retirement, you think about the money side of it a lot less, and you just focus on, you know, what do you want to do with your newfound time and freedom? And, and finding something that really gives you that passion and the purpose and, and that motivation, that's the hard part of retirement. And a lot of, a lot of people struggle with the transition. They call it the messy middle. You know, the first year is the honeymoon. Everything's great because you're not working. The alarm clock, you don't have to worry about it unless you have kids like Karsten. But, you know, <laughs> but then you reach a phase where you're kind of like, yeah, but now what? Right. And I am blessed beyond words that I've kind of discovered the now what. And, and my wife and I are running a, a fantastic charity it's called Freedom for Fido. We build free fences for low-income families. We live in the Appalachian Mountains. So there's a lot of the Appalachia remnants up here, a lot of poverty. And there's a lot of affluence, right? It's a very affluent retirement community. 
So what Freedom for FIDO has done is it's, it's kind of bridged those communities together where you've got the affluent retirees that are looking for a way to give back. And you've got this huge population of poverty that, that needs help. So we build free fences for their dogs. A lot of them are on chains. So we get dogs off of chains. And there's a whole community around it. We call it the FIDO family. There's over 200 volunteers now. And, you know, they'll, somebody will shoot out, of their, there's a group text with all the active volunteers, and they'll shoot out a text Friday, hey, let's meet at Grumpy's. Grumpy's is a microbrew nearby, and 20 of us will just, you know, bomb into, into these local establishments, and we have a blast, right? So there's a real sense of community. It's physical activity because we're out building fences. We're giving back to people. And, and I'll tell you what, you, you know, your listeners, everybody's thinking about the financial side of this spend an equal amount of time on the non-financial and, and get, get some pets too. Cause you know, cats are great. <laughs> we can't jump in the screen again for those on the podcast. Um, but, but we are absolutely having a blast. We've built 87 fences. We've freed over wow. 300 dogs from life on a chain. In addition to that, you know, I, I love my writing. I I'm still writing regularly on the retirement manifesto, but again, to me, that's giving back. That's helping people sure. who are behind me on the trail that, you know, I can share what I'm learning as I go. And, and to me, that's the same giving type of focus, finding a way to give. And, and it's so rewarding. And I feel so fortunate to have found two really big purposes in my life. And beyond that, we did buy a second home down in Alabama, just a small condo. But my daughter um, and our four-year-old granddaughter recently relocated to southern Alabama. So we made the plunge and bought a second home. And we spend a month or out of every month, we spend one week down there and three weeks up here in the mountains. And uh, we we're travel, we have an RV, so we do, you know, some smaller RV trips. We spend a month every summer and visit family and, you know, do things like that. Do a lot of Monday to Friday state parks, camping with the dogs. So we're outdoors. I'm, I'm outside every day. <laughs> I, I focus on fitness. We have a mile and a half trail in the mountains behind our house. I just, mm -hmm. I love my life right now. And uh, it's just, it it's something you work so hard to get to. When you finally achieve it, and and Eric, you'll you'll realize this. You'll 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 get the courage to pull the plug. <laughs> These are the best years of your life, and and I'm gonna make get sure of it. get to them early. Enjoy them while you can, while you still have your health, and uh, never look back. It's great. It's a great time of life. Well, we we just want to thank you guys for, you know, you are retired and you're still coming back to give back to the people who are still on this path, and and maybe the ones who are navigating the early steps here. So I can't thank you both enough for continuing to write and share the information that you do, and you know, give a sort of positive message to people who are following in your footsteps. Thank you so much. Let me add one more thing, if I could. I got to put a plug in here because this is ironic. Karsten and I, yeah, we had this little dueling blog post, one one post on mine, one post on his. At the at, Even before my post came out, this we had written it, but it hadn't been published yet. We both got invited, and we're going to be speaking together at the FI Chautauqua Conference in Ecuador the first week of October. So we can put a link in the show notes. But if anybody wants to hang out with Karsten and I for a week in Ecuador, we're both going to be down there. And uh, we're looking forward to it. So there, there's opportunities that just, it, the community is a great community. And uh, and it's it's an honor to be a part of it. Awesome. Uh, that's great. Yeah, we'll definitely link that up. And uh, just to echo Eric's thanks, really appreciate the work that you both do. You've, you've certainly both played an important part in my own run up to uh, RE just uh, two and a half years ago. And then since then, uh, and we'll be talking more about that in some upcoming episodes. But uh, yeah, thanks both. Thanks for coming on the show and uh, really appreciate what you do. Of course. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you.